Shalom, Professor Chomsky. It's great to have this occasion to talk with you. Very glad to be with you. Wonderful. I think we are living interesting times now in the Middle East, and perhaps before we come to reality closer here in Israel, we should say something about the wave, the wind of change in the Middle East. It's been uh, quite a spectacular uh, several months, uh, actually beginning in Western Sahara, spreading to Tunisia, then on to Egypt, a democracy uprising. Uh, which is uh, shaking a lot of the foundations of uh, policy uh, um, in, in the Western world, in Israel as well. And, of course, uh, uh, there's a major promise of change in the, in the region. I should say promise because uh, the regimes are still in place. Uh, it's possible that uh, the situation might revert to something like the traditional regimes with somewhat new faces and somewhat new rights. Do you think patrons in the West who have cultivated relationships with dictatorships all over the Middle East have something to fear as well? Well, for the, it's important to recognize that the West will do anything it can to prevent the rise of authentic democracy in the Arab world. And to understand why, uh, it suffices to uh, look at the studies of uh, public opinion in the Arab world. They're, these are studies that polls taken by the most prestigious Western institutions. Uh, uh, what they show is that uh, uh, in, in the Arab world, uh, the major threat by an overwhelming majority is regarded as Israel and the United States. Uh, there are some who regard Iran as a threat, maybe 10 percent. Uh, the, in fact, opposition to uh, Western policy is so strong that a majority uh, think the region would be safer if Iran had nuclear weapons. Under those conditions, the, uh, the West is obviously not, uh, not going to be able to tolerate uh, an authentic democracy in which people's uh, uh, attitudes and opinions uh, influence policy. Uh, reasons are obvious. It would dismantle the entire longstanding uh, system of uh, imperial control, plus uh, utterly undermine current policies. So it does give the lie to the uh, imperial presumption of exporting democracy on bayonets in the Middle East or elsewhere. That is for, you know, that, that line is for uh, ideologues and propagandists. I mean, it's never been true, and it's certainly not true now. I mean, take right where you are, for example. There's been one free election in the Arab world, namely in Palestine in January 2006. Well, what happened? Uh, the United States and Israel and Europe didn't like the way the population voted. So they immediately, U.S. and Israel, with Europe tagging behind, immediately subjected the population to severe punishment, to punish them for voting the wrong way in a free election. Well, that tells you all you need to know about the love of democracy. Uh, in fact, it's kind of interesting to look at the latest uh, WikiLeaks exposures. Uh, what received the big headlines in, in the United States and Europe uh, was the, uh, 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 the happy conclusion that uh, uh, the Arabs support U.S. policy, Western policy on Iran. Well, what that meant is the Arab dictators supported, not the Arab population. The Arab population strongly opposes it, overwhelmingly. But for Western uh, intellectual culture, it's sufficient if the dictators support us. doesn't matter what the public thinks. Uh, taking a longer view of the role of the U.S. in, in the Middle East, ignoring other, uh, other areas, uh, are you surprised by the late, by the recent American veto when uh, the UN Security Council discussed Israel settlements in the occupied territories? Well, the only thing that surprised me was the reaction to it. The latest resolution was kind of a little bit on the comical side because uh, the US was compelled to veto a resolution which uh, 
called for what it claims is its own policy, namely uh, ending settlement expansion. Uh, the, the, the entire, virtually the entire world agrees on a political settlement, namely uh, pretty much what was in the January 1976 resolution. So the U.S. and Israel are the two rejectionist states. They're barring a political settlement, uh, as they have been doing for 35 years. So you wouldn't advise opponents of the occupation, uh, Israel's occupation in the West Bank and, and Gaza, to rely on Obama's administration to question radically U.S. imperial policies in the Middle East? Well, on the contrary, Obama is one of the worst. It was clear that he was going to be one of the most extreme opponents of uh, Uh, the international consensus on a political settlement. And that was made clear right away. There were illusions, but uh, there was no basis for them in the first place. Uh, they've collapsed in the Arab world, as the polls I mentioned indicate. It's kind of remarkable that they're still held in some circles in Israel on the basis of absolutely nothing. Uh, he's taken an extreme position in support of... Uh, Uh, is the Israeli uh, occupation and uh, the Israeli atrocities. Well, well let's, let's perhaps... In fact, he not, it's not a position. He participates in them. I mean, when uh, a couple of days ago uh, uh, military helicopters were killing people in Gaza, they're U.S. helicopters. Surely. Um, let, let's go back then, let's go nearer home, at least for us, to Israel itself. Where do you think the recent upheavals short, they're not really revolutions. Where do you think they place Israel, who has claimed for so long to be uh, the only democracy in the Middle East? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the claim is a little weak. Israel claims to be a democratic Jewish state. Uh, well, that's a, that's a contradiction. Uh, it wouldn't mean much if the commitment to being a Jewish state was purely symbolic, like uh, having the day of rest on uh, Saturday, but it's not. And if you look at Israeli uh, laws, administrative relation, regulations, and so on, they have made a very sharp distinction between the Jewish majority and the non-Jewish minority. Uh, up until the year 2000, uh, most of the land in the country, about over 90%, was essentially in the hands of an organization which is, uh, Karen K. Emmett, which is uh, committed by uh, its contract with the state of Israel to work solely for the benefit of people of Jewish race, religion, and origin. And in fact, uh, non-Jewish citizens were kept off the land. Well, in the year 2000, the, the court, Supreme Court, uh, technically revised that. Uh, now there's Knesset legislation Uh, trying to undermine the court decision. Actually, what's happening is that while there's a, uh, a democratic uprising in the Arab world, which would be very welcome if it's not to Israel, uh, it's going in the opposite direction in Israel. Uh, I'm sure you read the article uh, a couple of weeks ago in, uh, by the head of the Israeli Bar Association, Shlomo Cohen, mm -hmm. in which he uh, warned that Israel is moving to fascism. That was his term. So, in your view, dispossession and systematic discrimination radically undermines Israel's claim to be a democracy? Yeah, that's quite apart from the uh, legislation that is now being considered, maybe some of it's already passed, uh, in the Knesset. Uh, for example, uh, uh, investigating uh, uh, the funding of uh, human rights organizations. Uh, like uh, Batellan, for example. I mean, that's the kind of thing that the head of the Bar Association was talking about. And yeah, the, I, would not, I think his word fascism was a little strong, uh, but you can understand his concerns. Uh, if we move from uh, the current wave of anti-democratic legislation and actually measures on the ground, to a vision. Could you, could you spell out elements of your vision for a democratic Israel? I wonder how far we can share it. Well, a democratic uh, Israel uh, presupposes the opportunity for a democratic Palestine. That means uh, the occupation 
uh, has to be brought to an end. Now, it's worth remembering that as far back as 1967, uh, Israel's uh, highest legal authorities uh, instructed the government that any a settlement in the occupied territories was is contrary to uh, uh, international law. Now, that's later been uh, uh, reiterated by the UN Security Council a couple of years ago by the International Court of Justice, uh, with the U.S. Justice uh, agreeing with the basic point in a separate declaration. So it's not really in contention that the settlements are illegal. And of course, settlement expansion is multiply illegal. Well, you're not going to have, you can't really talk about a democratic society as long as it's radically violating uh, international law uh, by its own uh, conceding it itself uh, uh, in, in the uh, area of in which it uh, uh, exists. And then internally in Israel, uh, my own view, which goes back to, I, I should say, just to clarify matters, that in the 1940s, I was a uh, Zionist activist, Zionist youth leader, but I was opposed to a Jewish state. I was uh, committed to the uh, binationalist conceptions that were partially uh, held by Hashem Eretz uh, others. Uh, I thought that a Jewish state was, was a mistake. But once it's established, okay, it's there, has the rights of uh, any state in the, region, in the world, uh, no more, no less. However, it should move to be a democratic state, that is, the state of its citizens. And do you and think that's not a Jewish state? And the state of its citizens, in your eyes, means individual equality, civic equality, or also collective equality for communities, for national communities yeah, within Israel? Well, as I, I still believe what I believed back in the 40s, that it should be. I mean, there are, it is a. Uh, like it or not, it's a binational society, uh, culturally, um, uh, uh, in practices, uh, language, and so on and so forth. And uh, multinational societies, binational societies can be democratic. Uh, but uh, I, the point that you're making, I think, is accurate. There should be uh, the rights of communities within a democratic society can be preserved in, in many ways. My own view is that all of Palestine, that is the former British mandate, uh, should be uh, integrated into a, uh, uh, a binational uh, democratic society. And I should say that I, that's, that's a long-term process. It's going to take separate uh, stages. The first stage, only suggestion I've ever heard that makes any sense is uh, that the first stage would have to be the two-state settlement of the international consensus, then maybe you can move on from there to further integration. And I should also say that I don't see any particular reason to worship uh, the boundaries that were imposed by imperial force. Uh, that's a, long, a longer-term goal, but I think it's one that people can aspire to, nothing wholly about the imperial-imposed borders. Do you think this can be helped from outside? Do you think international community, social movements can do something to prevent uh, the danger of a rapid escalation of a war targeting Iran and the whole world? Oh, I think so. Uh, first of all, we should be clear about exactly what the Iranian threat is. Okay, uh, Iran's an awful state, a separate question. But what is the threat of Iran? Well, actually, we have uh, an authoritative answer to this question uh, from the uh, Pentagon and uh, the U.S. intelligence services. Uh, they say Iran is not a military threat. They say it has very low military spending. Its uh, military doctrine is uh, defensive. It's designed to uh, ward off an invasion. Uh, they say if Iran is developing nuclear weapons, which they don't know, uh, it would be part of their deterrent strategy. And Iran, they say, has little capacity to uh, deploy force uh, elsewhere. Well, that's essentially accurate, I think. And we can easily understand why uh, uh, Iran would be developing a deterrent strategy, just to look at its position in the region. In fact, uh, 
one leading military, Israeli military historian a couple of years ago wrote that uh, if they're not developing nuclear weapons, they're crazy. They need a deterrent. Now, what can be done about this? Well, one thing that can be done is to reduce the level of threat so they don't have that pressure for a deterrent. But a more far-reaching uh, goal, and a very realistic one, is to do what virtually the entire world wants, namely move towards establishing a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. Israel claims that it needs nuclear weapons. I think that's quite questionable. In fact, it can be rather plausibly argued that they harm Israel's security. Professor Chomsky, you, you were uh, prevented from entering the occupied territories in Israel uh, and portrayed in Israel's mass media as, as, uh, as an enemy of, of Israel's people. Uh, perhaps that stresses also, uh, one question is how dangerous uh, you think you were and for whom? And the second is, given this stance of the uh, mass media, surely the role of independent democratic media become, is even more important than ever. On the latter question, yes, mm. obviously, much more important. Uh, that's a major role that the social media can play. On what danger it posed for me and, incidentally, my daughter uh, to enter Palestine, the answer was very clear and explicit. I mean, when this blew up into an international inc incident, the Israeli government started producing a long series of lies about it. But what they objected to was Buse, the Palestinian University, inviting someone on their own, incidentally, not to talk about the Middle East, I was invited to talk about U.S. global policy, uh, but they invited them on their, on, on their own without authorization from Israel. And that's what they objected to. If I had agreed to go to Israel, and, as I've done before, and then go to Birzeit, there wouldn't have been any objection. So that's the threat. The threat is uh, Palestinian independence. Professor Chomsky, I'd like to thank you for joining the Council of the Social TV. We'll need your voice. We'll need your voice quite often in the future, and we'll be raising ours. So I'd really like to thank you for this interview. Good to talk to you. Hope we have another chance.